<laughs> hey there, scary story fanatics. Welcome back to Cleaving Thought from Bone with your host, Sociopathic. Winter is in full swing, and it's important to bundle up and avoid frostbite. But of course, the frost isn't the only thing that bites. If you're up for some frosty fear, settle yourselves under some blankets and lock the doors. It's time for a little story that I like to call, When Do Go Hunting? The smells of sweat, cleaner, and fear hung thick in the air. A vengeful plethora that seemed to reinforce Danny's feelings of guilt. Danny sat on the cot, his head held firm, lowered into his hands. Tears welled up and leaked from his eyes, streaking down a seemingly contrasting, apathetic expression on Danny's face. He knew where he was, but any who might look upon him would perceive him as distant, thoughts running rampant and playing out some unseen event behind Danny's distant, watery stare. It was like a twisted movie from which he could not escape, though he desired to desperately. Danny began to weep a little harder. The sun started to shine a little more brightly through the bars on the small window boasted high on the east wall, but Danny's thoughts lingered on the events of the day before, about the legend he took no faith in. The police wouldn't return to check on him for quite some time, leaving him to the devices of his own nightmarish thoughts. He would be dead by the time they returned. Gloves, boots, orange wool cap, everything was in place and the group of middle-aged friends were preparing themselves for opening day rifle season. The group was comprised of three best friends, having grown up together in the same small town, attending the same school. Most of their peers left after graduation, off into the world to pursue whatever dreams they conjured but this assemblage of companions had remained behind. First, there was Gavin, a mid-sized 34-year-old with broad shoulders and meaty forearms, tempered by stone and sweat at the local quarry. In his off-season, Gavin made a living splitting and selling wood by the cord. Next, there was Al. Al was a great guy, easygoing and quiet-mannered. He was a little stockier than Gavin and Danny, but he was also a little taller, too. What Al lacked in speed, he made up for with his lengthy stride. They would all need as much energy and strength as they could muster. The three of them had planned themselves a long and arduous day. Danny led his pack of friends out of the cabin that they rented. Danny was relative to Gavin's stature, but noticeably scrawnier. However, Danny made sure to compensate for his short and gaunt frame with textbook type A aggressive personality. Both Al and Gavin were wise to Danny's nature, but enjoyed his company for as long as the two could remember. The two of them both considered Danny to be the fire of their little fellowship, always talking big and willing to have a good time. Danny never had made much friends growing up, much like Al and Gavin, and it was this social awkwardness that forged their friendship years ago. So none of them gave it a second thought when Danny suggested they head up to his family's old cabin deep in the wilderness of the Rocky Mountains to enjoy a little hunting trip, just the three of them. The only second thoughts that were given were provided by Gavin, who first had to run it by his wife. 
If he made plans to leave her alone with their two sons and young daughter without consulting her first, she would have had his ass. Gavin was the only one bound by marriage out of the three of them, having been lucky enough to marry his high school sweetheart. Al and Dan hadn't been so lucky, and finding a woman in this part of the country is slim pickings. But Deborah, Gavin's wife, was generous and understanding, and had no issue with Gavin joining his friends for the weekend. The week, the ride there, everything impacted by the hectic nature of daily life blurring the events leading up to their arrival into the single, congealed memory. But now, stepping out into the blanket of grayish white, exposed flesh graced by the kiss of winter's embrace, the thrill of the hunt placed the here and now into the forefront of their perceptions. The dim glow of the early daybreak caressed the surrounding forest in a contrasting shine. As dark as the morning sky was, the green pines painted black by darkness underscored the subtle glow of the heavens that may have been mistaken for night otherwise. It was very early in the a.m., and the three friends were beginning their hike into the woods, southeast to the cabin, gaining altitude with each and every step. They had received word when they had rolled through town, about thirty miles away from their current location, that the elk had been pushing higher and higher into the mountains recently, giving the group sound advice as to where to begin their expedition. To begin with, the trio decided it would be best to find an ideal location to sit and wait. Danny wanted to immediately start with a push strategy, using Al and Gavin to flush any prey in his direction, but Al and Gavin insisted on playing the patience game once they could decide on a good place. Dan tried his best to plant his foot and remain firm on his strategy, even giving them an ultimatum that he would just go back to the cabin and sit it out if they wouldn't indulge him by noon, and they agreed. The thing was, both Al and Gavin had no issue with this request, preferring to set up a push if their plan failed them for the duration of the morning. So they appeased Danny only due to mutual agreement, not due to his demanding. An aspect critically left unsaid by the both of them, satisfying Danny's narcissistic demeanor. Danny was never too fond of the cold, and he did not like being able to smoke cigarettes, but found hunting elk absolutely exhilarating. Al and Gavin liked hunting, but enjoyed the comfort of the cabin the best during their little ventures, especially in the winter time. Gavin resented the freezing temperatures the most, but did his best not to let on, as Danny would be sure to tease him. As old as they were, set deep within the years of adulthood, the three would revert back to their adolescence whenever they got together. If Gavin were to complain, it would likely result with snow being stuffed down the back of his shirt when he wasn't paying attention. Al was all about shooting a nice-sized buck, and was way too laid back to make any complaints about discomfort. If things got to the point where he wanted out, he would just head out without nothing but a quick remark to his cohorts. Instead of complaining and hanging upon strategies, the three of them enjoyed a quiet walk, whispering stories to one another as they trudged silently through the thick blanket of snow. Only the crunch of the snow beneath their feet could be heard as the lot approached what they deemed a worthy place to sit and wait. They cleared themselves an area on the outskirts of a large, snowy clearing behind some thick underbrush just inside the radial tree line. The smells of winter, snow, all gave off an intoxicating aroma of cleanliness. The three of them sat patiently, staring through the branches of the brush, making sure to be downwind. Hours passed by, 
into the darkness of early morning receded to a brighter shade of pale gray, the evergreens changing hue from dark black to a rich forest green, each branch topped with a dollop of freshly fallen snow. Maybe it was the unknown presence of a malicious lurker. Maybe it was just the fact that Danny couldn't wait for a cigarette, but not a single glimpse of life made itself known to them. Having had nothing to shoot at for hours, and Danny's increasing impatience, the three of them moved on and began their push slightly before the noon deadline. With a push strategy in mind, the group trekked deeper into the forest, breaching the tree line at the opposite side of the clearing, the desolate, isolated cabin getting further away with each passing step. Al stood in place, surrounded only by the silent yet omnipresence of trees, fumbling with the contents of his pockets. The push was now on, Danny sitting high atop the ridge, awaiting any subsequent game that may come strolling by as a result of Gavin's and Al's strategic herding. Gavin was on his way toward Danny from the south, helping to bottleneck any prey that may try to avoid the valley of the ridge. However, all this left Al with a great opportunity. Al had just finished smoking a joint that he had rolled for himself before the three departed from the cabin. The lefty having been smoked down to nothing but barely a savable roach, Al now searched his pocket, trying to attain sufficient enough grip to pull his eagle flask free from the snug jacket pocket. Gavin and Danny would have likely given Al shit for lighting up and possibly scaring any possible game away, but the isolation and the push presented him with the opportunity too good to pass up. With a gulp and a gasp, Al finished his slug off the flask and began screwing the top back on. A loud discomforting sound startled Al into dropping his flask in the snow before he could place it back into his pocket. The unnatural echoing made Al's hair stand up on end, his mind hopelessly wrestling to fit it with some sort of psychological label. He didn't hear it land. He had no idea the thing was behind him. When Al turned to investigate, he was greeted by a skeletal deer-like skull with sunken yellow eyes silhouetted by two large, leathery, black, bat-like wings. The details of the thing's large, yellowed fangs dripping with slimy, thick drool were the last sight Al would ever see. He never even had a chance to scream. The snowfall was beginning to pick up, threatening to cover up the tracks leading very deep into the forest left by the hunters. Gavin having made it back to Danny, not having stirred up any game, Al had yet to make his appearance, and due to the long wait, Gavin started to worry. Danny was sure that Al had simply gotten lost on his way back to the ridge and would be found with some minor searching. So. In a mission to locate their lost friend, both Gavin and Danny left the ridge, plodding through the snow in a direct route towards the general area of Al's last known location. Gavin called out for Al, over and over again, Danny only sneering behind his friend when he wasn't looking. Danny was convinced Gavin was making a mountain out of a molehill and that Al was in no actual danger. Danny was becoming lost in thought, resentful of not landing an elk, begrudging both his missing friend and his worried one for impeding on time that could be better used to hunt. Danny's attention snapped back to reality when Gavin took off running through the deep snow as fast as he could towards a scene still unnoticed by Danny. What is it? Danny yelled out to Gavin, but Gavin just stumbled forward without a reply, without 
hesitation. By the time Danny was halfway to it, Gavin had stopped stock still, standing over a gruesome discovery, and it was here that Danny realized what it was that Gavin had seen, causing him to abandon his search and dart away. Blood. Contrasted by the bright white snow blanketing the forest floor were puddles of wet red surrounding bloody snow that had melted down into a thick burgundy slush. Spread away from the gruesome scene in all directions was more blood still, lightly coating the snow around the setting, forming the consistency of dark cherry snow cones. Danny walked up and stood next to Gavin. We don't know that this was him. It could have been a wolf or some sort of... Danny explained, knowing full well that most animals don't typically move the carcass, begging inquiry as to where it was. But Gavin didn't need to agree with Danny. Danny just watched on as Gavin said nothing and leaned down, bending forward so as to pull something up off the ground. Danny was just about to ask him what he had found, but his words halted when Gavin turned to show him a bloody, half-empty metal flask, the image of an eagle engraved on the front. Dude, that's Gavin's flask, Danny exclaimed. No shit! What the fuck do you think happened to him? Gavin yelled at his friend. Listen, man, don't panic. The worst thing... Danny stopped talking mid-sentence. His eyes grew broad, his face turned pale, and his jaw went slack. What is it? Gavin asked him, instantly recognizing that something was behind him, something that terrified Danny to his core. Gavin walked forward, turning around as he did, until he stood right next to his friend. Neither of them could believe, could comprehend and label what it was that they were looking at, a creature that stared back at them with yellow, gleaming eyes. The creature stood about seven feet tall, its hide was covered in thick, dark brown fur and tucked behind it were two large, folded wings. The thing stood on two feet like a man, each arm and leg ending with a claw-like hand or foot, dagger-like talons at the end of each digit. Its top was crowned with antler-like horns, and its deer-like snout scrunched and let out a grunt, and its breath fogged the wintry air. With a loud, unnatural noise, the creature lunged at the two of them, both now fumbling with the safeties on their guns. Gavin and Dan began unloading ammunition before the thing had even gotten within twenty feet of them, and the both of them were great shots. Danny noticed that their barrage of gunfire was doing nothing. He distinctively saw a shot penetrate the thing's head, but it just kept coming, completely unfazed. A loud whoosh of air, and the creature flapped its now giant, unfolded wings and leaped straight up into the air. I'm out, Gavin yelled, hoping Danny would cover him. We don't have much time. Th that thing's gonna come back. We've gotta run, Danny yelled at his friend, now freaking out in alarm. Do you think we could even outrun that thing? My god, Danny, what the fuck is it? Gavin screamed at him. Danny's thoughts hung stale on Gavin's inquisition. A dark thought passed through Danny's mind, and Danny muttered his notion out loud under his breath. What? Gavin asked, not quite hearing him the first time. I don't need to outrun it, Gavin. I just need to outrun you. What are you talking about? Gavin asked Danny, confused, but when Danny lifted his gun slightly and pointed it at Gavin's leg, he clearly understood what Danny meant. A squeeze of the trigger and a loud echoing bang 
Danny didn't stick around to experience any more than that. I'm gonna fucking kill you, you son of a- Danny stopped running when he heard the sound of something behind him, Gavin's vengeful words falling silent. Danny saw his friend get ripped apart by the grotesque, winged beast, his arm that was held up in protection of his face, his chest. Danny couldn't stand to watch any more of his terrible plan set into motion. His friend's screams echoed through the trees as Danny fled for his life. It wasn't long before Gavin's cries fell silent. When Danny arrived at the police station the following day, he mumbled on and on about guilt. He told the detectives everything, the winged creature, the blood they found with Al's flask, their encounter, and his betrayal. Locked up and placed safely behind bars, the cops left a man with an apathetic expression on his face to his own devices in the subsequent cell. It had to be what he had seen. He had heard the legends, but never believed a word. His testimony to newfound faith was spelled out plainly for all to see. For when the cops returned later to check upon their newly acquired prisoner, they discovered Danny's wrists torn out, bits of flesh hanging from his teeth below two vacant, lifeless eyes, staring lifelessly at the opposing cement wall, his final word, Wendigo, drawn out in his own blood. Okay, I get it. If you can't see the monsters of myth or sense their presence, it's difficult to believe they're even there. But then again, if made known by the sensation of sinking teeth beneath your flesh, you may be a day late and a dollar short. So, if you want to stay on top of things, make sure to drop by again next weekend for some introspective. And until then, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications so I can catch you all again next Saturday. <laughs>